no better place to be this morning. I'm going to look from a, a few scriptures this morning. I'm going to be speaking about yeast this morning. The Bible's an old fashioned word, it's called leaven. It's an, a, a, an agent that makes bread rise. And there's a picture in the Bible of many things. Uh, to understand it, Jesus said in Matthew 13 33, and I'll read it out. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until it spread through all of it. So yeast here is not, he's not talking about actual yeast, it's what it does. It spreads through the whole batch. It's about the kingdom of God. Is, you know, once they, like, if a family gets saved, then it can move from the family. The family of God can go through all kinds of people and all around the world. So it permeates. Me and you get saved. We tell our families. It moves and, it, and it's, it's a picture of yeast. Or how yeast acts. But then Jesus spoke about yeast in a different way completely. On, an, on a negative side. On the opposite way. And I'm going to read out Matthew 16. Well, I'll read it from Luke's Gospel. Luke actually explains it. Luke um, 12, verse 1. I'll, re I'll read both so we get the picture. Matthew 16, verse... Six. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they're disgusting. They didn't really understand what it was. So if you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. Meanwhile, and verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So he tells you exactly what the yeast of the Pharisees are. When, he, when, when Matthew wrote it down, they started arguing between themselves. What is it? Because we've just had bread, because they've just fed 5,000 and they got confused. But then Jesus said, no, the yeast of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. He names it right out. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, I just want to thank you all for the privilege of being here this morning, my God. I thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your grace and your mercy. You are so worthy to be praised. Man. Father, I ask, my God, that you take your precious and only word, speak to our hearts and our lives, my God. Father, I ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Jesus spoke here about the, the yeast of the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees and Sadducees was two group leaders at the, at the time. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees today, uh, literally in, in Israel, but also their kind of teaching permeates through the world. And this is what Jesus was saying, be careful of the, uh, the yeast of their teaching because what it means, it spreads like false doctrine spreads. We've got the internet at the moment, people Google something and they listen to all these crazy teachers and then it, one tells another and they send the video and all of a sudden you've got loads of people believing that something are absolutely false and it's just spread by itself. Mm. That's the nature of, of yeast. You only need a small, the Bible says, you only need a small amount of yeast to affect the whole batch. And that's how bread is made. In the, the time of Jesus Christ, they would have um, one lot of yeast and they'd only take one, it's actually three nips. In the Greek it means three nips. Three nips like that. And put it into the next batch. And then three nips would affect the whole batch. And it would make it a rising ancient. It's where we get the picture of pride rising up. But here Jesus explains the hypocrisy of their teaching. As hypocrisy. And so... And Jesus warns his disciples about this. So in the same way, me, me and you need to be warned about hypocrisy. Because it permeates, it, it spreads so easily. It so easily affects every, every single one of us if we're not careful. And that's why Jesus used the word, he said, be on guard against it. That means it's going to come. You need to be, watch the door. Watch it doesn't come in. Watch it doesn't spread into your lifestyle. And so, you know, the picture of um, hypocrites, it comes from a Greek word, Hippocrates. It's the hypocrite a oath where they would not tell what um, the if, if somebody goes to the doctor, they're not going to tell everybody what's wrong with you. 
It's the hypocritical oath. It's the, the promise not to do that. But also it comes from a Greek tragedy play. You know, the big, big, these big um, arenas where the Greeks and Romans would have. And obviously there was no sound system. And there was people looking down from the, right from up the top. And they couldn't really see what was going on. So the actors wear would have two masks. A black mask and a white mask. The white mask had a smile on it. And the black mask had a sad face on it. So when they were playing a happy part, they would put the white mask on and everybody would know what's going on and then the, vice versa. But it meant putting on a front that wasn't really you. And that's where we get the, word, the modern word hypocrite. And so when Jesus warned about it, it means basically this, pretended, pretending to a status before God which you don't actually possess. Pretending to be something before God which you not, are not really that person. And that's exactly what it means. It means being phony or putting on an outward appearance. And let, let me just tell you something. You might think, well, I would never do that. I, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I would never do that. Let me tell you something. Jesus warned the disciples and he warns us today. And he warns us for a reason because it can happen. And it does happen. Because when we happen, what happens in our lifestyles... We all go through ups and downs. Every one of us in our Christianity is strong or weak. You know, we go through that walk with Jesus Christ. Sometimes we're up there praising our hands and sometimes we're just dragging ourselves to church. But when you pretend to be something that you're not really, to try and give over that you are something that you're not really, that's hypocrisy. So you come out as so much holy and you can lift your hands and you can pray and say these righteous great prayers. But inside, Jesus talked about them, full of dead men's bones. That's when he talked about the Pharisees. He said, you're full of dead men's bones. And what that meant was, they were, he said, you're whitewashed tombs. And that, there was whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones at the time. Because a Jew couldn't walk on a grave or touch a dead body, they would paint the tombs white. So when they would come through the night, they wouldn't be able to walk in that place because they would be unclean. He said, and you're like that. You look nice on the outside. It's all painted white. But inside, you're just full of dead men's bones. And that's what we can become like if we just try and put on something that we're not really. We're pretending. We're acting out the Christianity. And I'll tell you one thing I've learned in Christianity. You can only act it out so long and the real you will come through in the end. No matter how much you dress it up, no matter how much you have a suit and boot and say the right words, it will come out. Because the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart speaks through the mouth. And that's what happens. You can only hold that mask so long and it will slip and fall. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, his mask has slipped? Well, that's exactly what it means. The mask has slipped. And what happens when under pressure, the inside really comes out. Amen. It's being phony, put on an outward garb or religiosity, but inwardly still having the same old evil thoughts and angry moods and bitter attitudes. That's what Jesus said is the leaven or the, the yeast of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy. But let me just tell you something about people who, who put on hypocrisy. You can hide. You can hide. You can put on that mask. Listen, it may slip down then, but you can put on that mask. And you can put on a good show. But at the end of the day, if you put on a good show for everybody in this room, what is the point? Because we're not judged by the man and woman that's in it, we're judged by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God, the Bible says. So at the end of the day, hypocrisy is stupidity. Because who are we trying to kid? Okay, you might go through your life and everybody might look at you and think, well, that's a good brother or that's a good sister. But who then you're receiving your reward on the earth, you're receiving your praise for something that you're not really. There's no inward work. There's no real manifestation of the work of the Spirit. It's just false hypocrisy. And me and you can fall into that. Let me tell you, good Christians can be hypocrites. That's why Jesus said, be on your guard. Be on your guard. And what that means is to check the doorway. Check nothing comes in the door. And you know what we need to do? We need to check our hearts. That it hasn't come into our hearts. And we're not just living a false Christian life. If you're in the sea and you're drowning, but you've told everybody, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an Olympic swimmer. Right? You've told everybody you're an Olympic swimmer. Okay, that's cushy. You're an Olympic swimmer. But you're out in the sea and all of a sudden, because you're not a really Olympic swimmer, you can basically only just paddle. You start to drown. You start to go under. And people's going to say, oh no, they're all right. Because they're an Olympic swimmer. 
they'll manage. They're just messing about. Because I know they've told us they're an Olympic swimmer. A person like that can't receive no help. And that's what we can be like as hypocrites. We can put on that false show of, you know, bravado and strong Christianity and, and getting through things when we really need help. But we're putting on this false Amen. hypocrite's mask. Amen. It's like people who come into church and pretend. I know people that pretend to be Christians. And you try and preach the gospel and share them. Oh, yes, I know. It's all true. It's all true. It's all true. And they can't be out because they won't admit who they really are. And that's what we can be like. We can to pretend. We put on the outward show. Listen, we might fool the eldership. You might fool the preachers. You might fool everybody here. But there's two people that you're not fooling. is yourself and God. Because we all know what we really are. It's Jesus warned against it. Beware of this kind of thing that would creep into our lives. It's such a horrible thing. Because it's so far removed from what God wants for us to live by true Christianity. Then he spoke of the leaven, or the, the, um, the yeast of the Pharisees. And then he spoke about the yeast of the Sadducees. Matthew 16. And he, he's, now he's already spoke to the Pharisees, uh, sorry, the Sadducees uh, before this. And he's actually rebuked them. Um, in Matthew 22 he says this, Jesus answered them, You are deceived. You don't know the scriptures, all the power of God. And he was speaking directly to the Sadducees. So when he spoke about the uh, hypocrisy of the Sadducees, the other group at the time, so there was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he said they both got yeast, but they were different. The first one was hypocrisy. But the second one, we would call it in modern days, either rationalism or liberalism. And what they said is, we, we do everything, we live a holy life, we, we, you know, we, we walk about looking the part, and we make big decisions in the temple and things like that. But we don't take the Bible literally. We don't, you know, we say it's not really the word of God, but the, 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 the truth about God is true. But whether you, when you die, whether you go to hell or heaven, there's a different story. You know, what will happen in heaven? There was no real commitment to the word of God. And you'd think, well, oh, listen, we can't be like them Sadducees because we do believe in the word of God. What they believed in basically is this, when you, when you uh, grasp it all down, it's, it's that life only consists of everything that you can taste, see, Touch, smell, and hear. And there's nothing beyond that. That's what they believed in, basically. So all life was what you, what you, um, um, you can taste, you can see, you can touch, you can smell, and you can hear. Beyond that, there's nothing really. They believed in living a righteous life. They would be you know, very holy. They would keep themselves separate. They wouldn't lie or cheat or steal. But the Bible was, you know what? It's not really the word of God. And we've actually got people like live like that today. And they actually would say, oh yeah, believe in the word of God. But what does believe in the word of God mean? Let me just take us back for a second. What does it mean to believe in the Bible? So there's, there's lots of ways of believing. Well, I believe it all is the word of God. Or I can believe it's some of it's the word of God. Or I can believe it's just a good book. Ideas like that, basically. Or I can say, I believe it. But it doesn't apply to me. I believe it, but I don't believe it enough to actually do something about it. That's the problem. You can actually say, oh, yeah, I'm not like the Sadducees. I actually believe in the word of God. I'm going more beyond my senses. They were just sensual men and sensual women that just lived for to please themselves. It's what they could see, what they could hear, what they could feel, what they could taste. Everything was based about themselves. So really, at the end of the day, it was true atheism. They didn't believe in an external God. But they believe that they were actually God themselves because they have served themselves. They didn't believe in angels, life after death. They believe in rationalism. And me and you can fall into that situation. Because what we'll say is, because we're Christians, we say, oh no, we believe the Bible. But there's bits that I don't do. There's bits that I don't really believe. Because if I believed it, I put a scripture on the uh, WhatsApp this morning. Jesus said, if you love me, you would obey my commands. And, and Jesus basically says, you know, if you say you love me, then you would actually obey my scriptures. And the Sadducees were right under that line. They said they love God, but they didn't obey the scriptures. And me and you can be exactly the same. We can mean well. We can say that we love God. We can say that we're different. We can say that we follow people. We follow God. But I'll tell you what happens. 
We tend to cut and shut the Bible to sing, you know what, that's true, but it's not for me. That's right, I know it's true, we have yet, but it's not for me. And so we actually make ourselves into some kind of a demigod that we, we make a Bible to suit ourselves. So there's a bit of this missing and there's a bit of that missing. And we just skate our way through and say, yes, yes, right, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus. But we don't believe in Jesus of the Bible. We believe in Jesus of our own invention. We believe that's, and that's true Sadduceeism. We believe in Jesus of our own invention. Not one that's coming back and going to judge us one day. We believe let's just go to church and you're going to fall into heaven one day. It's going to be nice. It's good to live a Christian life. We don't believe in a, a, a Jesus that's going to judge us. We don't, you know, when we break bread this morning and we don't judge ourselves, we don't believe the scripture where it says some of you are dead and fallen asleep. And because of not judging yourself, we don't believe in that Jesus. We believe in a Jesus that's, you know, a little baby Jesus in a, in a manger. We don't believe in a Jesus that's going to come back on a horse one day and judge the world and every unsafe person will die on that day. We don't believe in that Jesus. We just believe in a Jesus who forgives and loves and, and just wants us to have missions and conventions and barbecues together. And that's true Sadducees. We pick and choose what we want to believe. And that teaching gets into our families, it gets into our churches, it gets into our life. And Jesus is speaking specifically about men and women today. Here, what's happening on the inside of our lives? Be careful that doesn't come into your life, that's what he's saying. Just seemed to be right, the Sadducees. They sought to be right. But there was no new life, really. There was no change. There was no conviction of the Holy Spirit. If they went and sinned, there was no conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what people like to hear. You know, they know they're not doing the will of God. They know that they'll step out, they'll shout, they'll scream, they'll argue, or, or they'll sin, or they'll buy, or they'll buy some child, or they'll go into drugs, or, or drink and, and drunkenness, and they say, oh, you know what, God loves me. Which God? It's not the God of the Bible. The Bible God said God hates sin. He hates the things that we do. And he will judge us for the things that we do. Which Jesus do we believe in? Jesus said to them, You are deceived. This is directed to the Sadducees. You are deceived because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And me and you can so much fall into the trap of the Sadducees in the teaching of the Pharisees. Mm. Where we are deceived. Oh, we say we, we claim to know the scriptures. We claim to believe in them. But we don't really because we don't live them. We don't really. There's no changed life. There's no power of God. That's what Jesus says. You don't know the power of God. You don't know that God can judge you in a second. By being out of the will of God. God can strike you dead and take you home one day. That's what the Bible talks about. But we live like the scriptures aren't true. We say they're true, but we live like they're not true. And that's why Jesus warned disciples. People who love Jesus Christ, who follow Jesus Christ, who work for God. Beware that this doesn't cross over your threshold. Be aware that it can happen to you. Going on, Jesus spoke of another yeast in the Bible. In Mark 12, verse 13. No, it isn't Mark 12. It is, it's Mark 12. Sorry, I'm looking at Matthew. Later, they sent to some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to what they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right you should pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay it or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is on this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's? And they were amazed at him. Jesus' warning about the, the, the yeast of the Herodians. Now the Herodians, now King Herod was a strange character. Um, he was a, a, a Jew, uh, as in a converted Jew. His father was a forced convert. He was brought up in Judaism. But most people didn't accept him at the time. But he, he, had, the, he had the title. 
Let's put it that way. He had the title of a Jew. And that's why the Romans used him as well, because he had power, he had money, and he had a bit of Jewishness thought, so they thought that the Jews would listen to him. But what really uh, the followers of Herod believed was that was might was the best thing. Might and money and strength and power were the things that you needed to really value in life. It's called today materialism. They taught that the great powerful and wealthy, if you can acquire wealth and power, you have the secret of life. That's what the hypocrisy of the Herodians was. They thought might was right and wealth was the best. You know, that, uh, that permeates among gypsy culture as well. You know, um, a lot of our people think, you know, or, you know, that, that man's got a ton of money, he's a very brainy man, or that man's, you know, from a... And, and we, we class them by the amount of money they have. But in Christianity, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, it's whether you love Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's how, you know, where we are in God. But many today follow this philosophy, I think probably more than any of us at the time. <coughs> Holding the attitude of what makes your possessions, what you possess, worthwhile. That's what makes it worthwhile, the possession of things. And that's, Jesus actually calls that evil. That's not the way you measure things. And what's happening in our people today, among churches today, throughout this land, is that we're starting to value material things, thinking that that's made us right with God because we have material things. It's almost like what the, you get this uh, prosperity gospel from, uh, I was going to say from America, but it's in England as well. Uh, off the internet, mostly of the other preachers who preach, you know, if you've got money, then it means you've been blessed by God. Well, you should have a word with the Apostle Paul. You should have a word with the disciples because they didn't have that. You should have a word with Jesus because he didn't have that. But they were blessed by God. It's not about the amount of money. It's not about how poor you are. It's about where you are in God. Amen. And Jesus spoke specifically about materialism. And the day that we live in today, materialism is pouring pouring into the church we're more interested in how we look and what we wear and if somebody says to you a nice jacket they'll go oh yeah it's a so and so oh yeah it's a so like, they, like you can't see the badge outside so you show the badge inside because that means I've spent a lot of money I'm a material man it's really cost money here nice shoes yeah they've got a, you know, they've got a red sole well don't you walk in the sole and you can't see that bit but we've become materialistic. We've become thinking that because we are dressed in such a way or have such jewelry or such a way that we have been blessed by God and that we are right. Let me just tell you something about worldly goods. We all want them. They're a great, great servant, but they're a terrible master. They're a terrible, terrible master. It will take the goodness of your soul and turn you inside out thinking that you're right because you have might. It's a terrible situation that we live in today where people's more interested in putting on their food on the internet of how much they've spent. Or if they buy a bag, like it used to be, if they buy a bag, they put it on the internet. That's no good now. Because then say, ah, but we took you back and got the money back. So then they buy a bag put the receipt on and show them paying the money that they bought the bag. That's right. That's true. It's thinking like, oh, because I bought the bag, I'm a great person. No, you're a div. <laughs> you're an absolute div. <laughs> Do you know, I learned something there. You know, Louis Vuitton, I mean, it's a nice design, isn't it? They don't make leather. They only make plastic bags. Come on. But that leaven, that yeast, permeates. It permeates. It's got so bad in some of the churches, the brothers were telling me in America, where they such believe that if you're not blessed by God, that you're not really Christian, because you haven't got the right suit or the right jewellery or whatever. He said they'll sell everything they've got, they'll buy a suit, they'll come to church, and they haven't got money for gas, they haven't got money for lecture, for petrol, but they come in a new suit to church to show everybody else, look how blessed I am. Sad but true. Right. Sad but true. You see, it's hypocrisy. It's this materialism that they want to show something. Mm. 
The Apostle Paul spoke about yeast. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He talks about a man living immorally in the church. And he said, I'll tell you what he says about it. He said, you're bragging and boasting about it actually. You're actually talking about it like it's something good. And he was talking about sin. Now it's transferred from the person. We've talked up to now about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians in our life. But then the Apostle Paul goes on to speak about the church, about sin in the church. Because sin in the church permeates. It goes through the whole batch. He says this, your boasting is not good. Do not know that a little leaven, a little yeast, ferments the whole lump of dough. Clean out the old yeast that you may have be a new lump of fresh dough as you really are unleavened. Unleavened means without yeast. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See the yeast that the Apostle Paul is speaking about today is sin in the church. He said, and you're bragging and boasting means you're allowing it to carry on. You're, you're bragging and boasting about, you know, you've done wrong. And, you know, God knows me heart. Or, you know, it's, there's, you know, uh, hatred and unbelief and, and um, holding back, holding um, unforgiveness in a person's heart. And what happens with that? It's a tiny, tiny little peck. Talks about three pecks that ribbons the whole door. You hold unforgiveness in your heart. One little peck. You lie and you hide it up, another little peck. You talk about somebody, and another little peck, and it affects the whole church. That's what the Bible says, not me. Amen. And he says, be careful of this hypocrisy, because it will destroy the church. He said, this is how we are to live. Now, he, talk, he goes on to talk about the Passover. Now, the Passover is an Old Testament, um, the greatest feast. And it was to remember when the Jews left um, Egypt and death passed over them and they came out into the desert and eventually they came into the promised land. And that night before they left, they had a, a Passover lamb and they cooked a lamb and they had to make bread without yeast to be in a hurry. Couldn't even wait for the bread to rise to leave. And that's a picture all the way through the Bible of how we are to be as a church. Without yeast. Without leaven. Without the pride, without the hypocrisy, without the sin. And what the Jews would have done, that they, today, even 3,000 years ago, and today they do it. At the Passover, the night before the Passover, the father, and the, because Passover and unleavened bread is, is, passes over each other. They're, they're the two same feasts. One's to three days, one's four days. They pass over each other. And on the day of unleavened bread, the father will go through it today, and they will get something like sweet, something with yeast in it. Some biscuits or uh, something. Uh, and he'll hide it around the house. And the kids that night, to learn about the Passover, have to go around with a small shovel and a feather. And they search the whole house and they sweep every little crumb out. And take it out and clean it in the bin. And they, burn, they actually burn it the next day. There's a special name for burning it up. And that's, a, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying, that me and you are to be like. We are to go through our life and check for that little leaven and get rid of it. Pour it out. This is what he says. He says, um, Therefore, let's celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, with malice and evil, but with the new yeast of the lead and bread of sincerity and in truth. You see, the opposite of hypocrisy, the opposite of all these things, is sincerity and truth. You can hide all that up to me and you. We can hide it from each other. But we can't hide it from God. And at the end of the day, what is the reason that we're in church today? Well, why are you here today? Why are you mean you here today? We come to hear the word of God. We come to grow in God. We come to maybe get help in prayer. We come to fellowship. We come to worship God. All of them things are true. But God isn't going to just judge us for that, is he? He's going to judge us for the reason we did that. That's what the Bible says. It's the reason that we did them things. And that's, it falls on this, sincerity and truth, or lies in hypocrisy. Sincerity, 
You know what the word means? It means clear. So if somebody can see somebody that's sincere. It comes from the word sun searched. Without wax. Lift up a piece of pottery that's look through the light. You can see a crack that's been filled with wax and painted over. Ah, that's not sincere. It's got wax in it. And we need to be men and women that will serve God. That will people look at them and say they're not perfect. But they are truthful. They're not living a hypocrisy life. They may not be perfect but I can see what they're doing is correct. And that's the word for me and you today. The Bible says this, that we are to put off the old lump and live but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul goes on to talk about hypocrisy, uh, sorry, uh, leaven in, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9. I'll read it to you. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9. I'll read from verse 7. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And he was talking about legalism. Legalism is saying that the law saves you. People get confused with holiness and legalism. No, holiness means holy to the Lord. You don't do stuff because you want to please God. Legalist believes just by doing the law that you're right with God. That's what it means. If somebody says you shouldn't smoke, that's not legalism. That's good advice. Doesn't mean you you're, you're going to get saved by not smoking, but it's a better testimony and it's better for your health. If I was to say that you have to live the Ten Commandments to get saved, that would be legalism, because it's impossible to do. It means to live the legal law to be saved. Should you not do it? Absolutely, but you do it because you love God, not to get saved. And this is what he was speaking about at the time. It destroys the fellowship of God's people. Because they're trying to live something that they can't live at all. And it comes to basic knowledge of salvation. And so many Christians have been to church for years. So-called Christians have been to church for years and years and years. And they come and they go and they're up and they're down and they have problems and they don't have problems. But they don't, don't seem to latch on. They don't seem to have that joy. They don't seem to have that new life that God really speaks about. They, they talk about it. And they can even testify about it, but inside themselves, it's not really there. Legalism think it is by thinking about keeping the rules that someone is saved. And we can come into the church and we can keep the rules. But keeping the rules is not going to save us. That's another form of hypocrisy. You're pretending to do things, but you're thinking that you're, just, you're saved because you looked the part. Because you didn't tell a lie this week. I actually met a man, this is the truth, this is not an exaggeration. I met a man one day, and he was truthful as far as he could understand. He said, yeah, he said, uh, I've been a Christian. He said, I'm almost perfect. He said, I only have to give up smoke. He said, and that's it. He said, I'm perfect. And he really meant it. He really, really meant it. I thought, I wish smoking was my only problem. There's so much more in our lives. But he was believing just by living that righteous sort of life, or outward looking righteous life. That he would be right with God. And I'll tell you what that hypocrisy does. It does away with the cross. You don't need Jesus Christ to die for your sin. Because you're going to achieve it by yourself. You don't need Jesus Christ to be your, to be your substitute. To be your, to one that takes your penalty on the cross. Because you're going to do it here on the earth. You're going to live the righteous life and think that you're okay. It's hypocrisy as well. No, it's always, always... By faith in what Jesus Christ did for us that we are saved. Mm. Does it mean that we shouldn't live a holy life? Absolutely. We should live a holy, separate life. Recognising that Jesus Christ is our judge one day and we live a holy, separate life. Forget the hypocrisy. Forget the might. Forget the wealth. Forget all them things. Is our heart right with God? With consciousness? Are we clear before God? That's the most important thing. And that's what Jesus spoke about. That's what the apostles spoke about. It's not what we do. It's what he 
did. You are saved today not because you've looked the part, not because you dressed the part, not because you say the right things. The only way you can be saved this morning is by trusting and having faith in what Christ done for you 2,000 years ago. That blood is still shed for you today. That blood is, is it possible that you can come to God today for a cleansing and you'll be clean, you'll be clear, your conscience will be right. And you won't be a hypocrite. And you won't be a Pharisee. And you won't be a Sadducee. And you won't be full of the old filth. But you'll have a new batch. And that's how God wants us to live for Jesus Christ. Let's bow our head and pray this morning and ask the Lord to help us. We're going to come around the Lord's table in a moment. So time to search our hearts this morning.